Hello, I am Maria Luisa Zorrilla, a faculty member and coordinator of multimodal learning at the Autonomous University of Morelos in Mexico. The dynamic of this short webinar will be in two steps. I will briefly expose the theme, and when I, while I'm talking, you can post your questions. At the end, I will check your questions and try to answer them all. So let's start. This seminar is about how to define search words and how to use different types of resources in your research. Research is part of education. When I was a child, I used to look for information in encyclopedias, and later in life, I had to spend several hours in libraries going through physical book files. Internet has changed all that. We live in an era of information, abundance, and availability. That poses different challenges for students, because sometimes it is difficult to decide what to look for, where to look for, and how to use different information sources according to our purposes. It doesn't matter if you're working on a thesis, a dissertation, or just a regular homework. In any case, you need trustworthy information. And the problem is that sources in the web are not always reliable. When doing research, the most reliable sources are of three types, books, articles, and news. There is also official information by governments and organizations, but we will not explore that type of information in this short webinar. In books, we find theories by experts who help us understand and explain whatever theme we are working on. Due to their editorial processes, books are validated sources we can trust. In the web, there are lots of digital books. We can also search libraries catalogs, and even though many books are not available online, we can locate a nearby library to check them physically. Articles meaning academic articles in prestigious journals, are the best way to identify the latest research in the topic of our interest, but also to explore the recent history of that research and the most prominent voices in the field. The bibliographies included in articles are excellent sources for identifying authors and books. News in recognized sources such as well-known newspapers and information agencies, are valuable sources to place our research topic in the real world. In many cases, the researcher has to explain why the topic is important to society, and news will help us to discover if our topic is current news, past news, or no news, and how it is perceived by media and society. Now that you know what you are looking for, it is easier to choose a search engine. When looking for news and general information, generic search engines such as Google or Yahoo are the best choices. But if you are looking for books or academic articles, the best search engines are academic ones, such as Google Academic or Microsoft Academic, or specialized databases such as Web of Science or Scopus which look into specialized publishers' databases. The problem with this is that a subscription is needed, individual or institutional, to gain access. Now that you have chosen a search engine, it is necessary to define search words. Most of us, when doing web search, just write some words and press the looking glass button. But we don't give much of a thought to those words. And believe me, they are very important. And we need to dedicate some time to explore which are the key words that better describe our research topic, and most important, that will deliver the best results. To define those words, first, we have to summarize our topic in one sentence. The best way to do it is to express it as a question, a hypothesis, or a problem, in order to focus on a specific aspect of the topic. Here we have three examples, exploring the same topic. The question, why do young people talk each other less? Or expressed as a hypothesis, the use of mobile phones increases the text-mediated communication between young people, 
resulting in a perception of decreasing need for actual conversations, or expressed as a problem. Conversational abilities in young people are decreasing due to the use of mobile phones. We chose the third sentence, the one that expresses the topic as a problem. The strainer technique is to use out, to, excuse me, to take out the prepositions, articles, conjunctions, adjectives, or any other word you don't consider essential. In this case, we kept four search terms. Conversational abilities, which we use with quotation marks as a unit. Our second term is young people, also as a unit. The verb decreased might be important because we are looking for a problem of less conversation and more texting. And our fourth term will be mobile phones, also as a unit. The next step is to experiment with our first set of words and look how well it works. For this, we will use the Google Academic Engine since we are looking for books and articles. Our initial experiment delivers only 13 results, and some of them are not relevant. Definitely, these are not the correct words. We identify that conversational abilities is something associated to language learning. Thus, we change it for face-to-face -face communication, and the results jump to more than 3,000. We browse the first 20 and notice there is a lot about mobile addiction which is not our main interest. Then we indicate with minus addiction to filter those results. Then we experiment changing all the words, including different forms of naming. We change face-to-face -face communication for face-to-face -face interaction. We substitute young people with teenagers. We change decrease for decline and use smartphones instead of mobile phones. With the new list, we obtain more than 6,000 results. But identify there are a lot of studies focused on psychological issues, which is not our interest. We indicate with minus psychological to filter those results and obtain 2,130 results with a high degree of relevance for our research. Even though we have identified a mix of words that produces a good combination of relevance and quantity, we decide to do some more exploration and replace face-to-face -face interaction with two terms, oral communication and texting. We also uh, use the term replace instead of decrease or decline. We obtain as well a good combination of results. Finally, we explore variations using orality and textuality and omit the verb. The list of results is also acceptable. So the best combination is number three, taking in account the number and relevance of results it delivers. If I had to do more searches in other searching engines for this topic, I'd we, I would use that combination filtering the psychological results. In this experiment, we used synonyms like replacing decrease for decline. We used variations of the same word like oral and orality or texting and textuality. We used different forms of naming when we replaced conversational abilities for face-to-face -face communication or when we change young people for teenagers. You might argue that changing the word sometimes changes the meaning, and it is true, but what we are looking for is to identify how other people doing research about the same topic is naming, what words they use. Later, we can choose to use the words we find more suitable. Before finishing, uh, let me tell you a small story. Now I am researching with some of my postgraduate students a topic that is called uh, new literacies. When we're looking for uh, sources in English, that is a little more easier because um, 
literacies, uh, there are lots of them in English, and there is the traditional literacy, the uh, information literacy, media literacy, visual literacy, transmedia literacy, but all of them are called literacies. But when we are looking for sources in Spanish, that is more difficult because there are different words for literacy. There is a, a traditional translation, which is alfabetismo or alfabetización. And that translation is um, closer to the traditional literacy. But there is also a newer translation, which is literacidad, which comes directly from English. And some authors use literacidad to refer to those new literacies. So when we are looking for alfabetismo or literacidad, we as researchers have to understand that authors imply different things using one word or the other. In this particular case, naming is no, neut no neutral. So uh, that, uh, this short story is just to emphasize the importance of naming or of selecting the correct words to name. So to summarize and to finish this short webinar, uh, we will um, go again through the steps we explored. So first, choose the right searching engine on the basis of what you're looking for. Remember that trustworthy sources are in general news, books, and articles. State your research topic in one sentence. Phrase it as a question, a hypothesis, or a problem. It is the best way to identify how are you focusing your topic. Strain your sentence, taking away all the unnecessary words to obtain a first set of search terms. You should have three or four terms, and some of them can be compound units. Experiment with your first set of terms, and depending on the results, quantity, and relevance, make changes using synonyms, variations, different forms of naming, and words in other languages you're familiar with. Remember that compound terms use more than one word, and that you should use quotation marks to indicate that those words are a unit and have to be together in the specified order. You can use minus to indicate that you are not interested in certain results. The use of minus is usually the result of previous experiments where you identify that several results include a perspective that is linked to a particular word. Filtering that word helps to gain relevance and cuts the number of results. I hope you found this short webinar useful and wish you have a fruitful search. Thank you very much. Now we are waiting. If you are, if you have some questions, I will be delighted to answer them. Uh, I I look forward to receiving questions from you. There's a comment here. The last one. Abugu Jutchuku won. So sorry if I don't pronounce correctly your name. Says it. It was an interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Um, I have here a question from Ileana Cuenca. She says, how do I know if an academic journal is reliable? I ask because I have heard there are some kind of fake ones. Okay, this is a very interesting question. Um, uh, what happens is that um, many universities ask academics to publish in academic journals, and there is a lot of pressure for academics to publish a lot. And uh, there, but uh, publishing in uh, prestigious journals takes a lot of time because there is a peer-to-peer -peer review process. And so sometimes you send your article as an, as an author, and it takes sometimes more than a year to get it published. So it's, it's complicated. And therefore, some publishers, like some of them not very reliable, created academic journals that have like fast track processes and they publish uh, fast 
they charge a fee for publishing to the academics, but they publish fast. And so um, this started to grow some years ago, uh, but the problem with these journals is that they don't have precisely peer-to-peer -peer review processes that are uh, kind of uh, rigorous or orthodox. So uh, there was a librarian, I, I remember it was maybe, um, his name was Jeffrey Bill at the University of Colorado. Uh, and he started to create a list to identify these journals. Most of them were open journals that had these kind of practices of, of having these, these fast track journals. And he started to create a list. Uh, they call them predatory journals. And this list was known as the Bills, the Bills list. But uh, some uh, publishers uh, g got very angry with this uh, librarian, and some of them uh, uh, managed to, to demand him to, to, to uh, go with a lawsuit against him for, for saying they were not reliable and they were predatory. So finally, he closed his list. The bill list is now closed. But you can find it in the web archive. And there o you can also find other, other lists. There is uh, one list uh, more recent of predatory journals that is based on the bill list, but it, it was o it wider. I, it has followed the, word, the, the work of this librarian. So at the end of, the, of my, uh, of my um, answers to your questions, I will put the links to these sources, to the bill list in the archive and to the other list of predatory journals. So yes, this is a good question because not all academic journals are prestigious or have sound peer-to-peer -peer processes. So if you are in doubt, go to these lists and look if the journal you're checking is a predatory one or is a prestigious one. Thank you for that question. Uh, I have another. OK, we, I have a question by Carlos Cruz. Uh, he says, um, what are the options if I don't have access to the article or book or I found? Yes, that happens sometimes. For example, when we look in Google Academic, some of the results have a link to a PDF, and you have the, the complete text available. But uh, there are others you only have the link, and you go there, and you see that you have to pay for the article. E and maybe your university doesn't have the subscription to that source, and you don't have access unless you pay. So what happens in that case? There are some alternatives. The first I would suggest is to write directly to the author. Most articles include the, the mail address of the author. And my experience is that most authors feel very, very fine if you write them and tell them, I, I am interested in your article. Can you send it to me? Many authors uh, answer back and send you their article. So to contact directly the author would be my first choice. Another option is if you live uh, near a big city uh, or a big university, the big universities, most of them have subscription to, these, to a lot of resources. So you can go to the library in that university and check if they have uh, access to, to what you found in your search. And you can down download it there and send it to your email or, or save it in a memory stick. Um, here in Mexico, for example, we have the National Autonomous University of Mexico, which has subscription to most resources. And if we are in a smaller university like this one, the Autonomous University of Morelos, and we don't have access to certain resources, we go to UNAM, this big national university, and there we can look for these resources we don't have access to. So maybe in your country, it is similar. And the third possibility is to identify some kind of um, uh, some students network, there are some of them in Facebook and in other social networks, where students share resources. So students for, from more advantaged uh, institutions where they have access, many of them are, are uh, available for sending you those resources. If you ask concretely, I need this article, can anyone send, send it to me? And, and these networks work uh, very well sometimes. So that would be some options if you don't have access to, to that, that research you, you found. So um, here I have another question by Lee Maus. Let me see. Hi, excellent presentation. Which, thank you very much. 
Which are the best search platforms? Do, do they change depending on the science you're researching, like a difference between linguistics or medicine? Okay, thanks, that's a very good question. Well, um, I think that the, the best starting point would be a generic search engine. Uh, as we explored, uh, Google Academic, for example, works very well for doing like a, a first exploration. Because in this, in this first exploration, you precisely can identify the most important journals or the most important sources that are, uh, that are um, publishing about your topic. So then you, go you can go to a more specific search. And a more specific search would be to go to specialized databases, such as, as, as I told, like Scopus or Web of Science, but they are still generic. They cover many different disciplines. And then when you look there, you will identify the journals. And then you can go to the specific journals, to the specific publishers that publish those journals you already have identified, and do a more focused search. So um, there are no specific uh, disciplinar uh, search engines, but there are specific disciplinar publications like journals. So when you uh, first explore in a generic um, search engine, you then identify the specialized publications and you can go to the databases, the ones by the publishers, and there you can find more information about your topic. So I would do it that way. And yes, you will find that some publications are totally focused on humanities, others are totally focused on natural sciences. Yes, uh, there, are, there are different vocations for different engines and different publishers. At the end of the questions, if, uh, I will be glad to share with you some list of uh, other places more specific for different disciplines if you are interested in, in going deeper about this. Thank you. Uh, here is a good friend, Michael Hoxman from Canada. Uh, He's, I said, you spend time on Google Scholar, uh, but, on Google Gen uh, but not on Google General. Is there a way to filter our types of sites, for example, commercial sites versus educational ones? Or is it possible to limit the search to those with substantial and reputable previous searches? It seems we get too much junk on our general searches. Yes, Michael, you're right, totally right. Well, uh, our friends of MailClick Mail clicks told me it was a very short <laughs> Facebook webinar, so I had to choose to focus on something specific. And I thought that uh, if we are doing academic search, uh, we I, we would focus on on Google and and how how we would use the the how we, we would kind of filter these these search words. But I think that um, learning to use the advanced features of Google, the general Google. L learning how to use the general features is very important. We have a MOOC, it is in Spanish, now it is active, it's, it's in our plat the platform is called Mexico X, it's the MOOC Mexican platform. This MOOC is in Spanish, as I told you, it is about uh, making academic searches in the web. It is a very large MOOC, uh, it, it lasts 40 hours. And we have one session totally dedicated to uh, explore all the uh, features that Google includes to do advanced search. And precisely is what you're talking about, Michael. When you uh, filter by type of domain, for example, you, you choose to only uh, um, have search, uh, search results with point edu or point ac of academic, if you only want research from educational or academic institutions, or you only choose point gov for having only results for government uh, pages, but there are other tricks, and we have a whole session and a whole and a complete uh, tutorial dedicated uh, not only to to Google Generic but also to Yahoo Generic and also to to Google Academic to use these features. So I would recommend strongly to learn these advanced features uh, to make a better use of the search engines and uh, filter uh, I I those results because, yes, you're right, there's a lot of junk and we have to learn how to, to clean all the, those the junk. So I will also sh uh, share the links to the tutorials. Uh, sorry, they are in Spanish, but uh, we, we will also look to, to share some tutorials in English for you 
if you're interested in learning more about uh, advanced uh, search features. Thank you, Michael. Mm, I don't know. Any other questions? I'm glad to answer them. Sorry. There are no, I, I don't know. We have one live question here, but I don't know if that is allowed. Yes, that's okay. Okay, we have here some students live in this short webinar. We have one student live, which, who is Uriel. Uh, and Uriel has a question. Do, do, does he tell it? Yeah, sure. Cannot, cannot read it, but we can put it here. Uh, Maybe. Asks, uh, what do you think of Wikipedia as a source of information? <laughs> Thank you, Uriel. Um, he, Uriel, if you if you didn't hear, uh, he asks, "What do I think of Wikipedia as a source of information?" And I laugh a little because that is a very polemic question. Um, <laughs> Wikipedia is is controversial. I I know there are lots of teachers that say that Wikipedia is not reliable, and uh, some teachers prohibit their students to to use Wikipedia or to cite Wikipedia in their works. Uh, but I I think that uh, Wikipedia is a very valuable resource for several reasons. First of all, Wikipedia has a very uh, strict peer-to-peer -peer review process. If you, uh, if you check any entry in Wikipedia, when there is some information that is dubious or, or that, that is kind of polemic, the editors of Wikipedia post no notes and comments about that information, suggestions. So the information that is published has this editorial process and, and the, the, the comments are at the light. And uh, Wikipedia is uh, um, constantly being actualized and, and checked by a uh, well, uh, a big army of, of editors. So, so the peer-to-peer -peer review process is, is very orthodox, first of all. So the information most of the time is reliable. Another thing important of Wikipedia is that most entries, or all entries, have um, sources. At the end, there is a bibliography of sources. And most of them, the, that sources are, are reliable. So many people say that citing Wikipedia is not a good idea, directly Wikipedia, because it is a very dynamic source. It is changing all the time. So if you cite Wikipedia, maybe uh, the people that will check your, your, your site, the, the citing will, will find a different thing at Wikipedia because it has changed when you read it and when the other people check it. So the best thing is not citing directly from Wikipedia, but looking for the bi bibliography in the entry and citing from those sources that are more stable that, uh, than Wikipedia. Other important thing about Wikipedia is that um, you can find things that you don't find anywhere else because it's very dynamic. It covers um, very actual topics and it also covers uh, some obscure topics. So um, it is a, a port of entry to a, a, a theme. You can have a general glimpse of a topic, uh, the, the most important issues or conversations about that topic, and then you can look in other places. But as a starting point, I think that is valuable, and I, I wouldn't satanize Wikipedia. There's a last one. There's I'm another. OK. Ileana Cuenca has another question. Uh, she says, thanks for sharing this lecture. I'd like to ask another one. My university does not have a subscription to many services. How do I find open resources? Thank you, Liana. Uh, this is important because uh, although many publications uh, charge fees to access uh, the articles and you need subscription, there is a movement uh, that started some years ago that is the open access movement. And this, um, this, was, uh, this started in the world because a lot of research that we do at universities is paid with public money. 
we we apply for for scholarships we apply for funds f to doing research and, and a lot of that funds are public and some uh, academics and, and and community in general terms uh, we started to worry saying okay the the research is paid with public funds but the results of those research uh, is is are, are under a key and you have to pay for them and the public has a right to to access that information so uh, then started this open access movement to open precisely the access to this research and a lot of journals and publications called open access have emerged and uh, most many of them are reliable and and, and very important so um now you there, there are um, directories and, and databases where you can look for for these kind of journals so at the end let me see if i have here precise information about that there is for example one that's called the directory of uh, open access journals uh, there is also one that's called oyster because of its uh, initials and there is another one called base I will also at the end of the questions include the links to these directories. In these directories you can look for open access journals. There are lots of them and many of them are very important. And also the prestigious editors, uh, the prestigious publishers such as Elsevier, Sage, Springer, Taylor and Francis, these big names, they are also, um, they have their open access alternatives. So. You can also look in the uh, in the main publisher uh, sites for open access, and they also have these options. So yes, luckily more and more we uh, have um, access to this kind of, of resources. Uh, and uh, well, for for people like us from countries that are not uh, so privileged, it is very important to to have these these options. Thanks for that question. There's a comment from Michael, and there's another comment from. Michael, uh, Michael says, he, he wrote in Spanish because he, he speaks Spanish very well, but he says, uh, very well, Maria Luisa, uh, I am worried about those students uh, who use Google in, a, in an easy way. And I, I totally agree with Michael. Precisely that's the problem, that even though Google is a very, uh, well, has very uh, mm, powerful uh, tools, to uh, do uh, web exploration in, in a very uh, sophisticated way. Uh, many students use it in a very basic way, uh, losing all that possibility. So as well as Michael, I am worried. Uh, I will be very glad if, if Mill Clicks uh, agrees to, to prepare a special webinar dedicated to generic Google and to explore all the features that Google offers for for doing academic research, uh, I, I think that that Michael uh, points a very important uh, issue. So yes, yes, totally, I, I agree with that, and and look forward to to exploring those those things uh, more precisely. And we have also another question. Um, it, she it's a Medina Medina. The, I thought the best search terms gave the bigger amount of results. Uh, but you say that's not always the case. Could you explain more? Thank you. Yes, um, yes. sometimes I, I've seen precisely uh, talking about what Michael says, some students get excited when they do a search and they say, wow, I got uh, one million results. That's, that are very good <laughs> words I use, no? But no, no, no not always having one million results is the best result because in that one million, uh, as Michael said, there is a lot of junk. So no, uh, the bigger amount of results is not a, a reflection of the the good. Uh, the the it, that doesn't reflect that th those words are, are a good combination. We have to look for a combination of amount of, of results, but also of relevance of those results. If we go back to our ex exercise, I will go back to the, to the table. If you see, we, I have five combination of words that I explored. And I chose that the best one was number three, which uh, with the minus psychological, it, give, it gave me 2,130 results. 
If you see, for example, number two gave me more results, it gave uh, 2,360 results. So if I would only value the number of results, my best combination would be number two. But as I told, it's not only about quantity, it's also about relevance. So the best combination was number three because it, it gave enough in number of results, 2,000, but the relevance of those results was also important. So my best combination was three, even though it didn't give more results than number two, they were more relevant. So to judge how appropriate are the words we're using for us searching, we have to judge those two things, the amount of results we are getting, but also their relevance. So the challenge is precisely to clean most of the non-relevant results and precisely to get a combination of words that give us most of our results with relevance, with relation to our interest. So I think that we don't get more questions. So thank you very much for, for following this short Facebook webinar. It was a very interesting experience for me. And I hope you, you, ha you find this useful and I hope you, you have very fruitful uh, results uh, searches in your future. Thank you.